we are going to ask ourselves in this next panel, uh, what are the opportunities for innovation in technology, in process and protocols, and in behavioral aspects and behavioral change related to healthcare delivery? We're also going to look at what are the potential drivers for investment, as if there's no one to fund it, that generally doesn't happen. <laughs> to moderate this panel discussion, please welcome NYU Langone Medical Center, Director of General Internal Medicine and Clinical Innovation, as well as a personal friend and role model to me, Dr. Cheryl Pegas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I was thinking that we all walked up here. We got our exercise in this morning. It's a healthy options uh, that are outside that we're eating, and so we're modeling the behaviors that we'd like to see. I know people are coming in. Please feel free to come in and have a seat as we go through uh, the event. I'd like to invite the panelists to come up. And we were just saying this, you know, as we uh, go on in our careers and the work that we do and that we're passionate about improving cardiovascular health, we all know each other a little bit. Not really well, but we've contacted at some point along the way. Let's see where everyone's sitting and then I'll go in order based on where the musical chairs are. All right, starting right here with me, this is Melina, Melina Adamian. She's managing partner of, of Azimuth Ventures and founder and executive director of Life Science Angel Network and a cardiologist. We have sitting next to her, Johannes Holtzmeister. He's CEO and CMO of CardioRentist. Sitting next to him is Dawn Bell, who's the global program head for Cardio Metabolic Franchise at Novartis. And sitting at the end is the CEO of Health Reveal, which doesn't say a lot about um, Dr. Reisman, who's the former chief medical officer also of Aetna and previously founded Active Health, which was acquired by Aetna um, during my time there. And I've actually had an opportunity to work with many of these people. I'm gonna tee this up in talking about heart failure of Really, why is heart failure back in the news again? Uh, because it comes and it goes, and then it's back, and it, we do this with a number of diseases, right? We know they're high cost, we know there's a lot of work to be done, but why does it come, come up at different times, and why do we see investment opportunities? There are a lot of people with heart failure. Many new cases, 550,000 being diagnosed every year, and it affects everyone. Yes, the demographics weigh heavily towards an older population because you've had chronic heart disease, hypertension along the way, diabetes, maybe having a heart attack, and because of treatments and technologies, you're living longer, and now with some damaged heart, you have heart failure. So definitely there's a demographic shift to heart failure. It's equal in men and women, but women actually die more from heart failure than men, some work that's being done. And it costs a lot because there are many people who are seeing physicians. So heart failure is in the news again because last year a great new drug was talked about at the Barcelona um, Cardiac Health Forum, um, the paradigm trial many of you are aware of. But I want to take us back to do we have a lot of tools already in this toolkit for heart failure? And are we utilizing them appropriately? So what we know about heart failure already, and we actually know this about many chronic diseases um, uh, that, that impact heart disease, is that there are lots of great treatments. Medications can be used effectively to treat and manage heart failure. We have had in this country in general poor adherence to medical treatments for many conditions. People talk about diabetes, hypertension, heart failure is one of the great areas that when you heard Jim talking about what are the things we need to improve, not just the new technologies, but how are we ap approaching health, prevention, wellness, this is an area that a lot of work still needs to continue and an innovative area for work to continue. And so though we have new treatments, and we'll talk a little bit about them, one of the things that we still have is how do we get people to utilize 
current existing treatments according to evidence-based guidelines. So this is not a, yeah, I wrote the prescription, the patient didn't take it. It's also how do we get physicians to also manage patients appropriately for these diseases. This is the drug that w came out last year. Doesn't have a name yet. Maybe Dawn will tell us if it has a name, but we'll just call it the cute, sexy name LCC 696. Great um, morning. That's what it goes by. And it's a combination of actually a known treatment for heart failure. Angiotensin uh, inhibitors have been known for a while to treat heart failure. There are a number of patients who cannot tolerate them, and we have what we call ARBs, which are angiotensin renin blockers, still working with that. So, what they've done is they've taken part of a drug that we know works, and they've added on another drug to that to help impact heart failure, and obviously they've had great results. I want to get um, primarily to having the panel begin to talk about these. One of the other drugs that you'll hear about today is eularitide, and that's an IV drug utilized for treating acute heart failure. This is a new oral drug. We'll talk about a new IV drug. So still lots of innovation going on in heart failure. My first question is for Dawn. So new drug came out, lots of excitement. I'm sure Novartis was thrilled. Did we need a new drug? Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I fully agree with uh, your comments earlier that we don't do a good job of uh, deploying the tools we already have, and that's certainly an area of improvement. Um, but even with the best treatment available, which certainly in the Paradigm trial, we were able to control that to make sure our patients were on optimal therapy, we still see a mortality rate of 7.5% a year in patients on the control group and a hospitalization rate similar uh, to that. So clearly there's unmet needs in heart failure, uh, but I fully agree that uh, we could be doing a lot better to manage patients. What we've seen in our data is that less than half of patients are managed on appropriate evidence-based therapies that are currently available and that are generic. So uh, we, we have a lot of room to do in the delivery of, uh, of these de And definitely if they're generic, lower cost. Absolutely. Have you guys yeah. looked at, and maybe Lonnie, this is a question for you, have you guys looked at why is this? Why aren't we using these appropriately? Why aren't people getting the treatments? Is it truly cost still an issue within um, this model? Well, I, I can tell you categorically that I don't think it's all about cost from the patient perspective uh, because we actually uh, did a trial at Aetna where we uh, waived copays entirely for drugs associated with heart failure myocardial infarction. Uh, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what was fascinating is as you'd expect, we saw an increment in compliance, and that increment in compliance actually translated to better outcomes, fewer hospitalizations and reinfarction, and we actually saved money on the process. What was really extraordinary was that despite giving those drugs for free for people who had had an event, we never broke 50 percent. The increment in compliance that we saw was 43 percent to 49 percent. So you've had an event. There's nothing theoretical. This is a wellness initiative 20 years out. This is you've had the event, you're being told you'll have another, and for free, we couldn't break 50%. The other issue, which I think is important, is the notion, which you touched on very briefly, but maybe with not as much emphasis as I place on it, is the role of the physician in all of this. So as I look at American Heart, American Stroke, there are registries that suggest you know, very clearly that, that physicians, for any number of reasons, knowledge diffusion, excessive anxiety about the risks associated with an intervention, Physicians aren't um, prescribing uh, the, these modalities as readily as they should, so there's an issue there. And the third thing I'll, I'll, I'll just make a comment about is the role of health information technology in all of this. We all talk about electronic health records, we talk about efficiencies, we talk about redundancy. What about efficacy? What about scanning those records, those EHRs, and identifying patients with low ejection fractions who, in fact, would benefit from, from products like the ones that we're talking about? What about using monitoring devices not only for uh, prevention and wellness, but to actually identify patients who are decompensating and would benefit from some of the new drugs that are being introduced? So I think as we talk about HIT and the $25 billion that we've invested in EMRs, we really need to sort of expand our, 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 our focus and our view and to consider efficacy and the optimal utility of some of these products that are emerging on the market. And so, Johannes, Lonnie's kind of dissing new products a bit. You know, he's saying we need some technology, and you have a new product, a new IV product. And so, is this a need, or is it again physicians not currently 
utilizing the products that we have to care for these patients? Or does the product that you're introducing, does that allow us now to care in different settings? Is there a home setting that's appropriate for using these products? And maybe that's the new um, paradigm shift because I think the use of registries to stratify patients is key. So how do you select the appropriate patients for a new product? Or are there still behavioral issues that need to be addressed? Thank you, Gerald. Very complex question. I tried to <laughs> dissect it a bit. Uh, first of all, I think we have to differentiate a bit between acute heart failure and chronic heart failure. And I agree what we have seen in chronic heart failure is a major step forward, uh, what Novartis did. In acute heart failure, there's nothing. So physicians don't, uh, we, we are actually developing uh, in our phase three trial against placebo on top of standard of care, which is 40 years old. But this is one of the last, what I would say, uh, battlegrounds in cardiology where we have double digit mortality rates uh, and, and um, there's actually nothing. So first part of your question, it's really an unmet need and it's not a constructed unmet need uh, to, to pursue anything here. In a second step, I think, and we will see how that will work out, uh, I think these therapies are complementary. How I understand LDZ uh, is working, it's a mechanism leveraging on a natriuretic peptide system which is endogenous in our body. We don't know all the details. You probably know more than I. Um, I think we will be thrilled having something for the acute care setting because there's a large unmet need if we can make then a second step having different formulations or having something attached to a device which would allow us to really look for a certain subpopulation of patients to um, prohibit decompensation, that's something we are looking into. It. Thank you. So we've heard chronic treatments. We've got some good ones. Need to figure out how do we get patients and doctors to do them. There's room for something new and nothing in intravenous. And Cardiorentis, the company that uh, was founded by Johannes, is really looking at that. In acute heart failure, uh, just moving to, so not the people who are walking around with stages one, two, three, and they're taking medicines, they can get uh, some treatments. In acute heart failure, we actually have some new treatments um, that we're utilizing, and some of them are surgical. And so, Malena, wanted to move to you and talk about some of the new, these new treatments for end-stage heart failure, how we're actually even using valvular replacements in some of these populations, um, in a population, by the way, where a number of years ago, they were too high risk to even have surgery and survive, and talk about some of the other bridges we're utilizing to transplant. Uh, well, I would like to thank you. It's it's very important uh, topic, and being probably the only person who has device background on the panel, I, was, uh, I wanted to cover that part as well. Uh, and go back to the title of, the, of, of our session, which is the economics of heart failure. So what we're trying to discuss here, I guess, it's the management of heart failure as a process, both clinically and economically efficient. And how do you make those two kind of goals uh, to meet? So on one hand, we do, so a heart failure, as everyone's uh, on the panel alluded, is incredibly complex. Um, I wouldn't even call it a disease. It's a, it's, a, it's a state on itself. It has multifactorial, a lot of factors contributing to it. So um, at some point, it's not just the pill management. It's at some point you, you make a decision to either um, to stop progressing over, over disease. And so that's where the you know, valves come to place, transcatheter valve replacements, or even surgical valve replacements come to the place. And there are devices like mechanical support devices, such as uh, hardwire and uh, Thoratec device, et cetera, those basically uh, devices that support your, your failing heart and have some, and there have been re recent um, clinical trials announced with fairly um, favorable results. Uh, what also affects all this process I get, is, is also economics of all of that, right? We all know it's all about reimbursement and um, not all about reimbursement, but a lot of that is about reimbursement and uh, how uh, the specific treatment modality is being paid. So with fairly, um, 
favorable reimbursement rates, ch reimbursement ch rate changes if, uh, as of last week, specifically for heart failure patients. You can see there is there is a there is a room to room to play. What are some of the companies in this area that's taking advantage um, of this space that that you're aware of working with? I well, if I may kind of depart a little bit from there, I would say that um, it's not just a specific device company, right? I think what we're looking at right now, and we specifically in our, you know, in our fund, we're looking at what Im improves, back to Jim's point, access and delivery of care. It's not just a single device, it's how you, or, or a pill, right? Because every single big corporation, from Medtronic to Novartis to, um, to J&J, um, and the smaller ones, thinking about merging those uh, devices and services together. So this way you provide continuum of care if you, if you, you know, speak uh, doctor's language, right? So uh, this, and, and this is driven by a number of factors. So one factor is obviously, um, you know, if you're thinking, thinking about economy, it's improving margins of those companies like Medtronic and St. Jude's of this world. They, they need, they realize it's not just, we're not just selling device, ICDs or, you know, or whatnot, but we also want to maintain contact with our patients. We want to deliver services. This way, we own that patient, right? And then third, uh, and then another important uh, point, which again, goes back to economics, it's a value-based care delivery. And that is uh, extremely important, the, the mechanism, the way <coughs> uh, physicians and, and um, traditional players and, and innovators in the space being paid. Let's focus on the economics a little bit. So if we believe that the highest cost is when a patient gets hospitalized, a lot of the, these treatments occur outside of the hospital. And to your point, Milena, it's not just a device, but it's the care management program that surrounds that. We heard Lonnie mention that even uh, when people have the drugs where they don't have a copay essentially for free, that it's not just making sure they have it so that there are other <coughs> components. So I have two questions. Um, one for Lonnie, what are the other components that are absolutely necessary for managing a chronic disease? What are the things that you'd put into place and who puts that in place? We've set some of the gaps that we see with physicians. So who are the other stakeholders who have to step in and make sure that we're building out the right um, components and some of these are innovators? And then the second for, um, for Dawn and Johannes, so if care of a chronic disease requires self-management, home management, and tools and technologies to support that so we impact cost, as you're building out these products and services, how much of your budget, your capital budget, you're putting towards that? Or how are you looking for partners to do that, understanding that you'll be judged on outcomes, not just on, you know, a, um, an a efficacy of, of the product. You first? You first. So I think the, uh, the, the fragmentation in the healthcare system that we all bemoan from a practitioner perspective, I've got a cardiologist, nephrologist, endocrinologist, actually exists at the, the macro institutional level. So if we're thinking about a population with heart failure, and be more specific, systolic dysfunction, or with critical aortic stenosis, speaking of TAVR, wouldn't it make more sense to organize an ecosystem where it isn't just the payer, it isn't just the payer, patient, it isn't just the doctor and delivery system, but it's actually the pharmaceutical company or the device company. And I think what's particularly flawed and what's sort of standing in the way of what is an obvious principle around the organization uh, is the reimbursement mechanism. We're all talking about value, but we're really be basically paying a lip service talking about well, a little extra fee for a care manager or a little bit of a bonus for some quality metric. If, in fact, <coughs> these products really provide value, and they provide enormous value, paradigm of 20% reduction in, in hospitalizations, there's real money in that. So to the extent that we could all work together to identify the drug, the device, the physician incentive, the patient incentive, to create an ecosystem where we're being rewarded financially for value and not having absurd arguments about unit <laughs> price, um, which we've all done a little bit of, um, I think we'd be in a better place. So I think we need a, a system of care um, which generally doesn't exist, but I think would address some of the issues that we're struggling with. Yeah, I, I Do ACOs address that? <clears throat> so that's a fascinating point. So the ACOs are at risk as a delivery system. 
If I'm running an ACO and I've got to use these magnificent capabilities for acute decompensated heart failure, for chronic heart failure, or for critical aortic stenosis, would it be unreasonable for me to approach the device maker, the pharmaceutical company, and say, look, why don't we all go at risk together and to the extent through a coordinated series of activities, an appropriate HIT platform, the right incentives for everyone, if we achieve the results that we see in these clinical trials, I think there's a great deal of money to be made, and I think that's the model we should be focused on rather than this unit price volume margin thing that everybody seems to be preoccupied with. Dawn, be careful how you answer all the academic centers in the room who are forming ACOs. <laughs> to we we're all going to try to protect them. Yes. <laughs> I, I could agree more that uh, there is a reimbursement system that really is uh, a bit, if I may use the word, perverted. Because what we find is that, just look, think, speaking of the U.S. market, obviously we look at this globally and see very different systems of delivery. But in the U.S. market, 70% of the potential patients are covered by pro Medicare Part D programs that have no accountability for the medical benefit. They're only accountable for the drug benefit. So they could care less if you prevent heart failure hospitalizations. They're just going to negotiate you an acquisition price. And so it's really difficult to have that conversation about value when the they don't have that same incentives around value. Uh, I think accountable care organizations are, are going to be helpful, and I really look forward to seeing some, uh, you know, I think there's some good data coming out of that. It's very interesting, I saw, read something just on the way in today, uh, that financial incentives, when these pay for performance, can only do so much. That there is some limitations to how that it does incentivize especially prescribers mm -hmm. and, and, and caregivers. So, so we really do need to think about the entire ecosystem, as you said, and what other levers uh, can, we, um, you know, can we pull to get the best care for patients. And I think we also need to think about um, you know, our compliance um, realities, uh, in, especially in the US. There are a lot of things as a pharmaceutical company we cannot do, uh, the things that you're talking about because of uh, OIG regulations and other things that would prevent us pr from providing you know, these kinds of um, kickbacks, which is right. what they would call them. So there's a lot of change that we'd have to make to the legislation in order to make that all happen. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Let's do it. Johannes, Let's do it, yeah. programs and <laughs> services as well? Yeah, Cheryl, I mean, we, uh, we are a small company, obviously, running a big program, but we, um, from the beginning, analyzed the different stakeholders. Uh, and the one stakeholder is a patient, of course, and the physician, the other stakeholder, are the different uh, reimbursement systems. And we kind of saw an opportunity to move away for approvability in acute heart failure only from symptoms to a more health economic understanding as well. This was particularly important for our uh, investors um, to demonstrate a value to the different stakeholder and to be a very proactive. Mortality only doesn't bring something to this table. You need to save free hospitalizations. You need to self save length of ICU stay. You need to save healthcare utilization costs, which is translated into worsening heart failure, which is a concept I think Novartis shares now too, uh, leading also a, a space in acute heart failure. Um, so yes, uh, it, is, uh, it is absolutely important because at the end, it needs to work for everybody. Uh, to bring something uh, new to the table. I almost think it's easier in the hospital because I think hospitals are yes. very used for a long time now to capitated systems. Yes. Uh, and so that the demonstrating those types of value propositions to hospitals for acute episodes of care seems to be a lot easier than in the chronic yeah, care space. I agree. But if they're being <laughs> penalized for readmissions and we could deploy your yes. capability at the home, yeah. then there's, a, there, yeah. Yeah, there's that, that piece as well, right? Yeah. Melena, companies in this space and when you're looking at them and evaluating them, I mean, we've heard cardiorentists, right? So you think of there was zero and now there's one company. Obviously, this opportunity, you're thinking of, of the investments because they've gone after it of filling the gap of need. What are the types of criteria? And I'll actually take this um, across um, all entrepreneurs um, on the, the panel. What are, what's the criteria that you're looking for when you're looking at, hey, is this a good company that I should invest in? Is this a good company to partner with? Many of us always think when we're looking at companies, will they be there in two years if we're not carrying them? Um, have they, do they understand the economics of what's necessary and understand reimbursement? I think many of us, um, we, we work on different programs. When we sit with a company, if they don't have a reimbursement model or understand what's necessary, it's a bit of a flag. Um, and conversations, particularly in the, in the U.S. market. And so with the companies that you look at, I'm kind of broadening back, um, again, focusing on economics. 
but what are the types of characteristics, be it from leadership or components, products, services, that you're looking for um, when you invest? We've got a lot of startup companies in the audience. Um, well, I mean, it really matters. It really depends on what sector, what type of a companies we're talking about. Are there two, dis I mean, at, at this point, since we don't, uh, I usually, it's a known tagline, we don't do drugs. We don't invest in, in, uh, in medications. Uh, we don't invest in pharma. So we just invest in medical devices and um, um, integrated healthcare technologies and technology solutions to, uh, to care delivery. Um, those are two distinct, um, two distinct, I would say, uh, areas. One, for medical devices, if it's, if it's a device and a, and a heart failure, we understand that most likely the device is going, it's a long, it's a long haul. It's a PMA, it's, it's going to be a lot of money, uh, a, a lot of resources, a lot of time and capital invested in that. And uh, so obvious, an, an obvious um, decision, why, an obvious you know, kind of thought process that goes into decision is whatever this particular device is solving a real problem, intellectual property behind it, team that can take it. There is no, uh, there is almost no, uh, obviously reimbursement codes and all of that, right? But uh, there is very little doubt about business model <coughs> about the specific device being deployed because it's very simple and straightforward. Now, when you look at the companies that actually deliver, uh, trying to improve uh, all that we mentioned above, access and delivery, and um, um, then uh, you're looking at a completely different set of um, set of um, criteria. Though leadership is always number one in, a, in, in either uh, in either case, but for in case of healthcare IT companies, you're looking at um, how much these people actually know about the ecosystem. You know, we see a lot of entrepreneurs coming with solutions and telling us, "Oh, we're going to do this and that, and the patient's going to pay, and or doctor's going to pay, or something." Even something. And my first question is, "Did you actually talk to a physician? Did you talk to a nurse? Did you talk to your target audience?" And they go, "No." Okay, so that's 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 a must, right? Uh, so Flag I mean, number I two. <laughs> <laughs> that's a must, and then uh, obviously, I mean, it has to be um, it has to be something that is not disrupting workflow, that is integrated in the workflow, that actually makes it more better and and more efficient in terms of if we're speaking specifically about man, you know, heart uh, heart failure technologies. I mean, uh, one of the examples is Medtronic's acquisition of Corventis, yeah. right? Uh, so it's a patch that, a lot, I mean, so, okay, it's a similar patch that helps them to take that kind of uh, care later on. Uh, we, we can more or less put in that category, I wouldn't call CardioMems really a health yeah. IT company. CardioMems has been around for ages and uh, it was investment of, of the fund that I was before as a medical device. But there's also Covidian that bought Zephyr Technologies, right? If you look at it, this is a wellness product. And, uh, you know, there's an expansion, clearly. So we're evaluating all, all kind of, all spectrum of that. And it's also that reimbursement today is based on outcomes. And if we see that the gap in outcomes is getting people to adhere, do self-management, these acquisitions make a great deal of sense as these companies look to how the new reimbursement models work in an accountable care world. Lonnie, same, same question to you as we look at, you know, how are you looking at new companies partnering? How in the space of impact and cost, what are the criteria that, that you're looking at? I, I think the, uh, the first issue is to be certain that uh, the company is addressing a, a real and tangible problem uh, which can be articulated um, and, and then impacted and my orientation is much more around a collection of capabilities that will address these very, very complex problems rather than a one-off sort of solution. So mm -hmm. if it's of a device that measures pulmonary artery pressures or diastolic pressures as a proxy for fluid retention, where's the context? So if you just simply send an alert to the doctor, the doctor's gonna say, I have to go to the emergency room, which is certainly not cost effective, or not infrequently ignore the, the, the data itself. If you look at pacemaker data, and speaking of stroke and, and, and the numbers of people with atrial fibrillation, where it's an incidental issue, um, there's a tremendous opportunity that's completely ignored. So again, incentives have to be aligned. I think there needs to be collaborations between payers, physicians, uh, consumers, drug and device companies in order to work toward an outcome which will then be rewarded 
by virtue of the creation of an intelligent reimbursement value-based system? I think just uh, having been in the startup world myself, uh, what I think investors are really looking for is a good team too. I mean, everything else everybody else has said is absolutely appropriate, but a team, preferably that's done it before, it's really easy to get your second investment than it is to get your first investment. Sorry, <laughs> startup entrepreneurs. Uh, that's the nature of the game. Uh, but you know, showing that and, and really just having yourself uh, organized. You know, frankly, your your you know having your business, taking care of your business. You know, having your documents in order, really having good books. Uh, and good documentation, I think, will really gives you a lot of credibility when you go in front of investors as well. Johannes? I mean, I had to raise more than $100 million uh, in a private placement. And uh, Let's just pause as you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you which obviously is, have skills, Johannes. Which is <laughs> unusual, uh, which is unusual for a European biotech with a single product. Uh, so we, we had a lot of entrepreneurial spirit, uh, spirit in uh, high net worth individuals. So it's a, but the bottom line was my experience over the last four years. You have to have a solid business case. I'm a clinical cardiologist by training, so I jumped in this from the, the cold water. But the reality is, and that was said before, what's your return on investment? And that's coming not from some beliefs. You have to have a model. You have to have to understand the reimbursement world where you are doing your trial in, uh, and that's complex. So absolutely yes. And there are good consultancies out there also for small companies helping you to do stakeholder analysis and all things of this. So I think it is, is it very encouraging what you're doing here because I think there are a lot of physicians having an idea, but they stumble over the first steps already, uh, uh, thinking it through how to get the money and how to build the case because flaws in the beginning, it's very problematic to correct when a trial is running. I'm going to open this up to the audience as well um, to ask questions. I know I've, I've monopolized a bit with the questions. They're the ones I had. Um, but would love to make sure that we get questions from the audience and things that you want to hear more about or learn about from um, these great leaders. Can so, you introduce yourself as sure. you speak, Lisa? I, I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Soonan um, from Venture Valkyrie. Um, you know, Lonnie, my experience is that payers largely want to see a return on investment from the investment they're making, whether it's a device or a drug or whatever, within 12 months or less. And a lot of times, the downstream effect in, in savings is more than 12 months out. How do you bridge that problem? For me, I would uh, identify opportunities where the return, in fact, is manifest within a year. So if you look at the Paradigm trial and you look at the splay of, of the curves, there's an impact that, that emerges very, very early on within several months. So I would argue that a lot of the, the emphasis um, with regard to return on investment relate to wellness programs and compliance programs for people with maybe low-risk diseases, all laudable efforts and goals but completely unrealistic from an economic perspective, given anybody's investment horizon. On the other hand, I would argue that it's conceivable to identify high-risk cohorts of patients who were destined to have a catastrophic event. And I would argue that there are physiologic antecedents that, in fact, predict a deflection, an inflection point where that event is about to occur. And I would argue that there are, there are drugs, there are devices, there are diagnostic capabilities that will allow us to identify and react uh, to those signals and in a one-year time frame have a profound impact, whether it relates to end-stage renal disease or heart failure or stroke and atrial atri fibrillation. I can go on and on, as you know. Um, but I think there are a lot of um, magnificent opportunities that are being overlooked because we're focused either on wellness or catastrophic outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I would argue just before the catastrophic outcome, there's an opportunity to intervene which is being missed. And that's where a lot of these products, I think, will have a, a, a huge impact. Other questions? I'm going to get a microphone right behind you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bev Lorel, one of the things the panel has not mentioned is that in the U.S. and in Europe, in advanced economies, slightly over 50 percent of the people who are repetitively admitted with heart failure do not have large hearts with poor ejection fractions. They have stiff hearts that are often thick-walled. And um, 
and yet they are presenting, and for these folks, we have no treatment other than yeah. treating hypertension, if that's one of the components. So it's not like we can design a system to encourage compliance or an accountable care organization to enhance that. What do you see as the innovation in this realm and also sort of the more complex economics about this since there's been so many efforts, investments, innovations that have failed disastrously? Yes, if I could comment on that, yeah. if you don't mind. So we do have an ongoing clinical trial <clears throat> with LCZ-696 and uh, her failure with preserved ejection fraction, um, which is, was a bit of a risky proposition to do a large outcomes trial in 4,000 plus patients in a field where you've had a lot of them that have not been successful. Uh, so we, you know, we think that there's a lot of value and, and tremendous value in engaging our academic community. And so we've engaged really the world's experts in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and designed this trial. And what we learned is that probably the, um, the mortality endpoint that you typically look for in the systolic dysfunction trials uh, is not as, uh, it's, it's a lower mortality rate overall, but it's the recurrent heart failure hospitalizations that are really part of the patient journey and that's really the important endpoint here. And so we designed our trial to look for the primary endpoint being recurrent heart failure hospitalizations in addition to cardiovascular mortality, talk to health authorities, they are aligned with that. And we think that this may be a formula for success along with a drug that hopefully will also be successful. Um, so um, a clear example of the unmet needs in heart failure where we still need to innovate on therapeutics and other, uh, you know, and other therapeutic interventions, you know, whether they be drugs or devices because uh, no, no proven therapies there. So thank you for bringing that up. Johannes, I know you wanted to comment yeah, as well. Yeah, so it's a great comment. Uh, we, we actually implemented that in our development program, so we have designed from the beginning to have these patients with preserved ejection fr uh, fractions in, and then we partnered with Roche uh, Diagnostics in understanding the disease also be better, so we, we have a large biobank of blood uh, understanding uh, in acute setting will be, I think, a tremendous pool for future ideas also if, if uh, we can't uh, demonstrate their particular impact in this patient population. But I agree with you. It's it's equally important, so our development program was not restricted to systolic uh, LV dysfunction patients. When do you think, both you and Dawn, when, when will early data results be available from either of these trials? From Relax and, and uh, I can't, uh, we're almost done. <laughs> <laughs> we're just starting. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we are for the LCD program, five just years. starting. Yes. <laughs> Other questions uh, in the audience? So there's one other topic we didn't discuss, and um, as cardiologists, you know, it's always one to, to bring up. So part of the journey of heart failure is how do you manage people who are end stage, and how do you impact cost, particularly as you look at the role of palliative care within that model? Lots of nods on the panel, because when you think of the continuum of treatment and care, you know, and the real question is, who takes that on in leading that? Um, there are some insurers who've taken um, you know, a dip in this water. There are definitely health systems um, that are looking at that. And I wondered from your perspective, you know, how active are those discussions? How do you look at them, particularly as you look at managing cost? If you're having repeat admissions every week, right? We've said it's 10% of the, of the population generating a lot of the cost, and a lot of it is at the end of life in a short time period and because of repeat hospitalizations. Yeah. Should I go start down coming this way? Bonnie, rock and roll. So we, uh, um, I, I've been uh, out of Aetna for about a year now, but we were very proud and continue to be proud of a program where we did two things to change the, the hospice benefit, whether it's uh, at home or um, uh, um, uh, at a facility. Um, one was to extend, expand uh, the anticipated survival for the for the patient from six months to a year. So we didn't have to grapple with this notion about the imminence of, of, of the patient's demise. Mm. The, the, the other component which was more important is that a lot of patients are reluctant to access these compassionate care programs because they think they need to waive their prerogative to access new and innovative mm. therapeutic interventions. We got rid of that too. <coughs> um, there, there's no reason to discourage people from applying and uh, participating in, in, in clinical trials. And the reality is, 
that once they've in fact attempted, in, in cancer we saw most of this, attempted an agent that wasn't effective for them, they were certainly much more, more, more comfortable and, and, uh, and, I, and we think uh, died in a much more humane way. So the way we structured it is that we would approach the family through care managers who were very elaborately trained, they were compassionate, they were effective, the, pre the uh, patients uh, appreciated it. And one of the things I think we didn't emphasize enough, and I guess I can since I'm out you know, for about a year, is that not only was this a magnificent program for patients, but it saved a lot of money. And if you think about the money that's spent on acute care, the humiliation, the, 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 the difficulty for the family and the patient in an acute care setting, it just makes so much sense. And I argued then, and I suppose I can speak privately now, about the, the financial benefit of actually doing the right thing for, for patients and their families. Um, I, I think that, as uh, speaking just from the U.S. perspective, as Americans in the American healthcare system, we're extraordinarily bad at letting people die with dignity. Uh, we will, it may be because I spent my whole career in cardiology and a lot of in interventional cardiology, and so this idea that we can save you, right? We can do it. And so I do think that leads, uh, you know, as a culture in our healthcare system that we need to get very comfortable with the fact that there comes a point in the journey of the heart failure patient where there really is not much more that you can do other than allowing them to die uh, gracefully and with dignity and comfortably. Yeah, yeah I mean, we are actually in including these patients in our clinical trial and we see our therapy or more as an intervention at the crossroad that we might shift some of these very sick patients towards um, recovering and then maybe suitable for other treatments. Uh, and we will see how that works. Yeah. Yep. Results again in two years. No, no, no. Quicker than that. <laughs> you said he's ready. We <laughs> it sounds like we're having a conference next week. All right. No, no, but it's uh, soon, well, soon. Yeah. I would say we're dealing, I mean, uh, end, end stage heart failure is a really, uh, is a really, it's not even complex, it's, it's an end stage heart failure, right? And so you're dealing with an extremely sick population. And what also is helpful to break down that population to, uh, to look at the socioeconomic class uh, and age, kind of age groups related to that, right, and cater to those, to those groups. Whatever needs to be, needs to happen in terms of delivery of the services, as you said, right, you know, to provide, uh, you know, kind of, you know, that end, end of stage, end of life uh, care with dignity. So that's what needs to happen. Also, when we we keep talking about repeat hospitalizations for this specific uh, patient group. There will be high, always go, all going to be, uh, there is always going to be a high rate of uh, repeat hospitalizations for this patient. What needs to happen, uh, I think we should focus on acute care in a hospital, on better uh, care delivery in a hospital, while, because it's, it's almost inevitable. These patients will come back. It's never going to be a single digit, I mean, unless we completely redefine how these patients are being cared. One of the things, though, in combining with that is a number of institutions have now put in place home management programs where you actually receive right. IV treatments, you actually get follow-up care, and there have actually been a number of studies on Walgreens published some uh, a couple of years ago. There is actually a gap, you know, when we think about innovative companies, opportunities, you know, finding that for IV treatment for acute heart failure, there's no comparative I would tell you um, Aetna does have a program that's based much more from who their members are and how they're treating. When you think of entrepreneurial opportunities of what's needed, this is a really big area that there's very, very little noise in about what needs to occur. And it's not just for um, people with heart failure, it's multiple other diseases. The services, that support system for providing care um, remains an, an area that, that is actually pretty fertile. Maybe it's something the panel we can discuss later, and we'll be back to you with a proposal. <laughs> Are there any other questions um, from the audience? The panel will be here um, a bit more if you do have questions as well, but I wanted to make sure um, if there are any. I'd like to thank our panelists, Lonnie Reisman, Dawn Bell. We have the wonderful Johannes Holzmeister and his company, and of course, Melina Edemian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.